My name is Chris Dubelar. All of you now know me. I've introduced myself to all the people I didn't know before. And today I am talking about mandatory calorie disclosure and what impact it has on how much people consume and how much restaurants provide in terms of the food. This paper is now under, just, just gone back, um, what, well, I guess almost a month ago now, uh, to second round review at Journal of Retailing. So hopefully it'll get in. Um, we'll see. Why are we doing this? Well, the usual reasons. The world's getting fatter. You know, uh, uh, certainly I'm not. No, no effect on me whatsoever. And I'll start breathing again. Two thirds of Australians are now classified as either overweight or obese. The same statistic is valid in the United States. Uh, Obamacare, as it's been called, or the Affordable Care Act, included uh, this requirement that energy be disclosed on all restaurant menus where the restaurant is above a certain size or where there's a chain with more than a certain number of, of outlets. That was supposed to start in 2017, but uh, with the change of regime, uh, it's been pushed back. It's just been pushed back again until June 2018. We'll see if it ever comes into place, but you know, anyway, it's still in train. There's been some previous research on this area. There's been stuff that's been done here. And there's been a number of metasyntheses and meta-analyses, systematic reviews, that sort of thing, looking at what the effects are. Some of those show no effect, none whatsoever. Some showed a reduction in consumption. And some even showed an increase in some specific kinds of consumption. So specifically, these previous reviews have been done. So these are in uh, chronological order for the systematic reviews and then again for the meta-analyses. And you can see the outcomes here tend to be either mixed. In other words, some things we had reductions, some things we had increases, some things there were no effects. Some people concluded no effect, no effect. Um, well, mixed effect, yeah, but the p-value was actually not significant. So we're sitting here going, well, hang on a second. Why is this the case? We took a look at all of these systematic reviews and these meta-analyses and realized, well, hang on. What these folks have done is they've cherry-picked studies. They've set up parameters and boundaries around their selection process in such a way that they could guarantee that they were going to get the result that they wanted. So some people wanted a result that said, oh, this really works. Other people wanted a result that said, nah, no point doing this. And some folks were, were trying to look at a specific region and saying, well, is this working? So for example, in the United States, there are some areas where they have Im implemented this already. So in uh, Kings County and I think it's Washington State, they've done this for a few years now. And so people say, well, is it working here? So they only study papers that reflected those particular restaurants. Well, that's pretty limiting. So we decided we need to go beyond that. We need to, to make it a bit bigger. So start off with a pop quiz here, folks. What do you know about food energy? So how many calories should an average sedentary, because, I mean, let's face it, all of us here work at a university. We know what we do. We come into work. We, with the exception of John, of course, who stands at his desk, we sit on our butts all day long with a screen in front of us, a keyboard in front of our hands, and that's what we do. We don't move around very much. Oh, and of course, as Alvin's pointing out, we shove food into our face all day long. But that, that's a minor issue. We'll, we'll talk about energy intake that's required. So can anyone tell me what the expected or you know, average sedentary male should be eating on, in a day? Calories? 2,000 to 2,500? OK. Very good. 2,400 calories per day, according to the Healthy Food Guide here in Australia. In the UK, they say it's 2,500. In the US, they say it's a little bit less. It depends on who you ask, but it's somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500. All right. Well, that's great news. So now we know that we can all go home, right? No, we need to know the females. <laughs> oh, you need to know the females. OK, sorry. All right, OK. Minor detail. Females, considerably less, but average weights tend to be lower. For whatever reason, they take the average female as being 50 kilograms. OK. <laughs> hey. 
<laughs> well, no, it's based on research. It's just not based on reality. <laughs> so, and I mean, a 70 kilogram male, um, my 14 year old son weighs almost 70 kilograms and he's, you know, that thin. So I'm not sure exactly how, how they, they come up with this as an average and the same with the females, 50 kilograms. Sure, if, if you're this tall, 50 kilograms is fine, but anyone who's a normal height, that's good luck. Anyhow, so we've got those as calories, but so what? What does that tell us? It doesn't tell us lots. What we now need to be able to do is say, well, how many calories are there in different kinds of food? So let's carry this on a bit farther. Can you tell me how many calories there are in each of these Macker's food? Because I mean, ah, I'm sure that all of us have at some point in our lives eaten at McDonald's. We may not choose to regularly go there. We may decide that we don't like the food or we love the whatever. But English muffins, McMuffin sandwich. A thousand, okay. Any other guesses? What was that, Jeff? I'm doing the math. You're doing the math. <laughs> well, see, that's, that's what you can do. So how many calories are there in a gram of, of protein? Four. About four. How many in a gram of carbohydrate? Nine. About four. How many in a gram of fat? Nine. Nine. OK. So you could go through, and you could multiply all this stuff through and figure out what it is. So I'm afraid the thousand's not actually in the ballpark. It's, it's less than that. So a McMuffin is 300 calories. And you go down to the big breakfast, it's 640 calories. And one of the things that, that comes out of this kind of revelation is people go, oh, is that it? Cool. All right. <laughs> Think of how many egg McMuffins I can eat every day. I can eat eight of those suckers a day. Woohoo! <laughs> and of course, if that was all you were eating, that would be fine. But what about the burgers? Again, at McDonald's, um, let's talk about the cheeseburger. How many calories in a cheeseburger? Anybody know? How many? I think it's about 600. About 600. All yeah. right. We've got to vote for 600. 400. Uh, 400. We're getting, we're getting closer. No, no, no. Wrong direction. 350? All right, well, okay, let, let's, let's put 350 on the table there. What about the Big Mac? As everyone knows the Big Mac, oh my goodness. Whoa. 700. 700, we got to vote for 700? 400 we got from Nicola? 1,000, someone says. Oh my goodness, well, I won't hold you in suspense any longer. 300 for the cheeseburger and 530 for the Big Mac. We're going, really? I thought this stuff was just absolutely full of calories. Wow. Oh, OK. But what if we add some drinks in here? Maybe some fries as well. Because of course, you know, if you're going to have, let's say, a, a burger, you're not going to just have a burger. You're going to have something to drink, and you're going to have some fries to go with it. So a small Coke. And of course, we always only have a small Coke when we go to McDonald's, right? Never a big one. No, always just a little tiny one. And small fries. Another interesting tidbit about the small fries, by the way. Did you know that the small fries used to be the only size that McDonald's sold? Now it's the smallest size they sell. So they've gone from this is how many fries everyone should eat or this is how many we're all willing to offer, to, well, you know what, let's start here and go up. So 102 and 206 calories. So if we create a menu out of McDonald's for a day's eating, so we have an Egg McMuffin and a small popper apple juice, that's 112 calories, so that's 412 for breakfast, quarter pounder with cheese, which is 520, small Coke, small fries, 828 for lunch, Big Mac, large fries, and a large Coke, um, 224, 366, that gives us 2360 for the day. 2400 is our limit. That's all right. Huh, not bad. I'm feeling pretty happy about that. 
But what, what about another restaurant? Let's take another American restaurant, uh, Pret a Manger, which is you know sort of this this French theme place uh, has all this lovely, lovely food. So we'll start with an almond croissant, apple, a side berry smoothie. Well, that's breakfast, 650 calories. A coffee, avocado and toasted pine nut wrap, banana. 595 calories, dinner, lentil soup. I mean, hey, come on, that's seriously healthy, right? That's gotta be good for you. Uh, falafel, metsy salad, green banana boo smoothie, 1,007 calories, 2,215 calories. Hey, all right. No sweat, right? We've just had two decent menus out of fast food places that's supposedly making everyone fat and yet we're under the recommended calorie intake. Hmm. All right, that's a bit weird. So that's really nice, but what does this mean? Where is this taking us? How is it that people are getting obese and overweight if this is what restaurants are serving up? Well, it's because You've, you've all heard the ads, have a break, have a Kit Kat. You know, have a snack. Great snacking foods. We don't just eat at mealtime. We also eat in between meals. One of the things I observed when I was uh, living in France uh, a few years ago was that the French people don't snack. They eat at meals. And they tell their kids, if you're hungry, tough. Get over it. You'll get dinner. It's, it's not like you're going to die. You know, get used to it. So they have their breakfast early in the morning. School in, in France goes from 8.30 to 4.30, but they get two hours for lunch. And man, I wish I could go to school in France. Because the lunches, oh my goodness, they're amazing. They, they provide the lunches. They have a chef at every school. They use local organic food that's prepared on the day for the kids, fresh, and served up. A three-course meal every day for seven euros per kid. Oh, my goodness. Wow, that was amazing. But then they don't eat anything again until they get home and have dinner at 6.30. So they just get used to it. So people eat more than just those main meals. They have snacks and lots and lots of these snacks. And we would then ask ourselves, but if people are actually rational, wouldn't having all this information, because on the back of every snack, it tells you how many calories it is. We know what the calories are in these things. We know, and you folks were able to tell me how many calories a person should have every day. So shouldn't a rational person change their behavior? But that's really the question that we're trying to address here. Does it actually help? So why this study? I've already indicated there were previous meta-analyses and systematic reviews. Why do we need a fourth? Well, as I mentioned before, what we've seen is that there were flaws in the previous meta-analyses. There was selective sampling that was being done. They uh, didn't have big sample sizes as a result of that. And they didn't take into account any moderators. They also used just a single level of model. So they didn't take into account any effects of the paper or the fact that multiple studies have the same reference point and all that sort of stuff. Besides, these previous studies contradicted each other. They weren't giving us the same message. If they were consistently saying the same thing, it's like, okay, well, there's no point doing another study. You're just going to get the same answer. No journal will ever publish it. None said that labeling would overall cause an increase in intake. So that's kind of a clue that, okay, maybe there's something good going on here. But so we wanted to really take a good look at it. So what we're doing, first of all, we're looking at two sides to this. And no one has done this before. Everyone's either looked at what the consumers do, and a few papers have looked at what the restaurants do, but never, no one's brought them together. So we're looking at the consumer side and the retail or restaurant side. The consumer side, what we're talking about there, is how the consumers react or don't to the presentation of calorie information. So do they change their behavior? Do they change what they select? The retailer side is how restaurants change what they provide, their offerings, when they're forced to reveal calories. So on the consumer side, 
the, the reason why this is particularly interesting is because about half of the dollars that people in the U.S. spend is spent on food purchased and consumed outside the home. Now you think about that for a minute. That's a lot of money on food outside the home. And it's not just that food outside the home is really expensive because that's about one third of total energy intake. So that, again, is a lot. So this suggests that restaurants may in fact be a good place to tackle this obesity problem. It may be a good battleground because we can't tell people what to do in their own houses. You know, you can try and they'll go, yeah, whatever, go away. Doors closed, you can't see. You're not allowed in my kitchen, so leave me alone. But we can control what goes on in public spaces. So the consumer meta-analysis, what are we doing here? Small subsets, total number of studies, so between six and 38 studies were included in each of these. Now note, by the way, just a terminology clarification, a study is not necessarily a paper. Papers will include multiple studies. So a paper may, for example, report what the effects are on men and women, and that would be two studies in the same paper. So just, just to clarify that, so six to 38 studies, they didn't include uh, moderators and they were again single, single levels. So we had 54 papers accounting for 183 studies instead of the maximum of 38, so that's a big change, a big step up. We also included um, multiple levels to account for dependencies. So dependencies based on the authors who are producing these, we find that there are certain people that publish lots in these areas. And we also are looking for dependencies within papers. So if you're collecting the same data set and then just slicing and dicing it and releasing information on women, men, children, all that sort of stuff, well, there should be some shared variance there you'd expect. So we're, we're pulling that out with our multi-level model as well. And of course, the moderators. So the moderators. Uh, prior studies didn't include these at all. They just went straight for the overall effect. And we broke it out into two parts, the, the study itself and the participants. So the moderators that we include are the design of the study. So the design is you know, within between all that sort of stuff. Labeling intervention, whether it was just calories or something else. Actual versus hypothetical choice. So is the person making the actual purchase and are they going to eat this food? Or are they saying, this is what I would do? We know from the, the research work of Brian Wansink that People will say, oh, yes, oh, absolutely, I'm not going to eat anywhere near that. I'm not going to use anywhere near that sort of amount of food. But then push comes to shove, well, you're not looking, so I'm just going to add some extra in there. So what we do in reality is often different from what we say we would do. The healthiness of the food, so whether the food is, in fact, junk food, uh, high in sugar, high in fat, all that sort of stuff, or if it's healthy food, lots of salads and you know, not tons of salad dressings on it, that sort of thing. The restaurant type, whether it's a fast food place or if it's a sit-down meal place. Uh, eating occasion, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. Uh, time since publication, because that has been seen as being important in some previous meta-analyses. And food type, so what kind of food we were putting in. So is it pizzas versus burgers versus mixed meals, that sort of stuff. The participants, we're talking about things like gender, you know, male versus female or mixed. BMI, body mass index, how big are these people? And you know, I, I know BMI is a terribly flawed measure, but it's the one that everyone uses and accepts at the moment. And age, well, age really, it's kids versus adults. We know from the portion size research that children respond completely differently to changes in portion size than adults do. Kids under the age of three, zero response to a change in portion size. Between 3 and 18, it gradually goes up until it approaches the adult response. Now, lots of reasons for that, uh, main one being biological. Their tummies are tiny. They're little, little itty bitty places that they can shove food. They're growing like crazy. They eat as much as they can. And then their stomach hurts, they stop. That's when you're really, really small. But as you get older, well, you don't need that much food. You're not growing quite as quickly. So you should stop before your tummy hurts but you don't necessarily do that. All right, so the dependent measure that we're using is raw differences. So how many calories do you eat in a restaurant without 
calories labeled uh, versus how many you do in a restaurant with calories labeled. So we're adding in the standard errors, of course, to give us the weightings for the meta-analysis. And the studies range from cross-sectional, comparing one restaurant with labeling to a similar one without. So at one point in time, there was longitudinal within. Here's a restaurant that today has no labeling, but tomorrow does. Let's compare the average consumption amount here today with what it is tomorrow. And the pre-post with control, where you do that, but you also have a second restaurant that doesn't add in calories. It's the same kind of a restaurant, and it's over the same time period. So you've got some you know, measure of whether there's something going on in the population that, that's causing these changes. So the model, and oh, great. Unfortunately, the, uh, the font kerning didn't quite work out as well as I'd like. So the first two levels are in this first line. So effect size is equal to this overall beta thing over here. Then we've got a beta for pizza. Now we introduced pizza specifically because the pizza industry in the US hates this whole idea. They just think this is the dumbest thing. They're claiming it's really, really difficult because, I mean, pizzas are made differently every time they're made. Of course, every other meal has done that too, but that's beside the point. Um, and the real reason, of course, is because pizzas are big and you're only supposed to eat one or two slices, but lots of people eat the whole thing. So if they have to provide calories on the total item being presented, it's going to look terrible for them. So they don't like that. Whether or not it was a beverage as opposed to a food, if the, what the labeling was, because some people included uh, not just calories, but another thing that's gaining popularity is how many minutes of walking would you have to do to burn off that Big Mac or whatever it is? So some people included both calories and something else. Whether they were females, whether um, it was a mixed meal, uh, whether they were children, if they were overweight or obese, if the food was healthy, and then we've got the two random coefficients for level one and two uh, at the bottom there. Level three, so this beta double zero is equal to this constant plus whether it's within versus between. This is the design of the, um, of the experiment. Uh, whether it's table service, whether it's lunch for, uh, or dinner versus anything else. Uh, whether it's just a scenario, so in other words, if it's actual versus real consumption, and how many years since the publication of the, the article. And again, the random coefficient at the end. So there are studies within papers, 183 total studies, represents individual papers, 1 to 54, and represents random effects in levels 1, 2, and 3. And these vectors were assumed to be normally distributed across the entire domain. So the consumer results, completely underwhelming. We were you know, really hoping for a really solid result. Because it would be nice to think that if you gave people additional information, they would take it into account and they would change their behavior. And that, yeah, that that's, would be lovely to think. But in fact, it wasn't that. On average, because these are random effects, so it's not a fixed effect, but it's random. So there's a distribution of results here. A consumer reduced food energy purchased by a whole 30 calories per meal. All right, wow, 30 calories. That's massive. Well, as we already learned from Jeff, that a gram of fat contains nine calories. So that's a reduction of three and a third grams of fat per eating occasion. Woohoo! Three and a third grams of fat, wow! So it would take 300 meals to equal a kilogram. So that's 100 days, basically, eating three meals a day. <clears throat> and that's 100, one kilogram of fat on intake, not necessarily in body weight. So, hmm. Some good news. Well, the effect is actually quite a bit stronger for people who are overweight. So maybe there's hope yet. Maybe the reason why it's not looking so good is because there's a lot of people that don't need to cut down on their intake. These are folks that aren't sedentary. These folks are, you know, they need the energy. Great, you know, they're folks who are, you know, not fat. They took out an additional 82 calories. Females took out an additional 60 calories. Table service, an additional 32 calories. 
and lunch meals an additional 25. Now, I'm going to mention this at the end again, but one caveat right here is that this looks like it's fully additive. We don't know. We don't have a way of figuring that out from these data. And I'll explain why at the end. But the best case scenario is an overweight female at table service having lunch. And then you would add 30 to all of these numbers, and they would pull out what 240 odd calories out of their expected meal consumption. All right, so maybe there is some, something to it. Maybe there is a benefit to doing this, because I mean, in the US in particular, it's much more that women are overweight than men. The percentage of women that are obese and overweight is higher than it is for the men. So, and the overweight people are responding, so they're okay. You know, it was pretty underwhelming overall, but it does seem to be fairly targeted, which is kind of cool. So that's certainly a positive side of things. Some not so good news. When you ask people, what would you do? They go, oh, I would definitely choose the no energy salad. Yeah, that's what I was going to have. But when they actually do it, they go, stuff that. I don't want that rabbit food. I want the real food. And they buy something that's a bit more. It, healthy food doesn't have the same effect. Now, it's interesting because we notice this in our portion size meta-analysis as well, that healthy food just doesn't respond as well to changes in portion size. Now, there's all sorts of possible reasons for that. This is not an experiment. Most of these are field studies. There's a few lab studies in here. And the same with the, the portion size stuff. There's lots and lots of field studies, which means you're observing people. So if people are already choosing healthy food, there's a bias there. So you know, I'm not sure that it's, it's actually that relevant. All the other moderators that we included turned out to be not significant. So we can just ignore those. What about the restaurant side? Well, we got some other interesting results there, too. Some retailers, like I said before, like pizza ones, hate this. It's too hard, but because it's the whole pizza, so it makes them look bad. There is an argument out there that suggests that restaurants may go, uh-oh, if we have to reveal calories, we're going to look bad if we keep everything in full fat, full sugar, and you know, really load it up. So maybe we better reformulate this stuff and, and reduce it. There were seven papers with 41 studies, over 33,000 menu items that we were able to put into our uh, meta-analysis. Again, some are within the same restaurant. So what they did before they introduced disclosure, what they did after disclosure. Some are between restaurants. Well, here's a restaurant, here's a burger joint that's got disclosure. Here's a burger joint that doesn't have disclosure. Let's compare their menus. And some are pre-post with control. So here's one that went from not to having. And here's another one over the same time period. Did they, in fact, also happen to change just because maybe there's a trend going on in the population to improve food quality? So once again, the model. It's not multi-level here, because we found that we didn't need to introduce multi-levels. We tried it, and it didn't make any difference, so we simplified back to a single level. So effect size is just the beta zero, whether it's between versus within, if it's children, pizza, beverage, healthy food, and how long since published. And R is the, the random effect. Once again, a whopping big result of 20 calories per menu item. Woohoo! Huge! Um, but that's per menu item, not per meal. So that's potentially understating the effect. Because, you know, if we said with our sample meals from McDonald's, you don't just buy a burger. You buy a burger, a drink, and fries. All right? So, and they do defend, depend on food type, which I guess kind of makes sense, you know, de depending on what kind of food you're, you're talking about. However, one thing that really shocked us was that when people reveal the calories of drinks, drinks go up by 106 calories. That's a lot. That's huge. Just remember how many calories there were in a small Coke. It's like doubling it almost. Wow. When comparing between restaurants, those that did disclose versus those that did not, there was an additional 170 calorie reduction. 
So when you control for what everyone else is doing, it's actually better than it initially looks like, which is kind of neat. We don't know why that's the case, but something that we're just throwing out there it needs further investigation. So calorie label discussion. Inform self-control, not to be the expected silver bullet. You know, we had hoped that if you tell people, look how much food you're eating, how, many, how much energy you're taking in, how much is this doing to you? Well, it's not really having that big an effect. Sure, when we drill down into it, people who are overweight, they're taking off more, and females are taking off more, et cetera. But, you know, we hope to have a more general impact, and that's not the case. We do have to say that some of the moderators have very small sample sizes, so children were not often identified as eaters, not identified uniquely as eaters. So sometimes there's families coming in, but we don't know how many of them were children, so we had to not count those as kids. Pizza restaurants were not well represented in the analysis. A lot of times they just refused to take part in these studies, it seems. So we don't have a lot of data on pizza restaurants, but they, you know, Anyway, that's, that's another issue. This suggests that there's a lot more research that we need to do in those areas in terms of primary data collection and finding out what's going on because it's just not well covered. So interestingly, restaurants do make those changes to menu items when required to disclose energy content, and that I found really interesting. So it suggests that restaurants suddenly start feeling guilty about how much energy they're putting out there. And when you look at the individual items that they're, they're changing and how they're changing them, they're often just reformulating them to have lower energy density. So they're not saying, okay, well, we're just going to, instead of giving you four uh, pancakes, we're only going to give you two. No, they would just take some of the fat and sugar out of whatever they're serving to make it a lower energy density, so, which is a, an interesting outcome as well. And Barbara Rolls, who is one of the gurus in this, this area in terms of food composition and, and portion size, has been going on about this for a number of years and has really been saying, look, the big thing that we need to do is to work on energy density. If we work on energy density, we can solve the obesity problem straight away. And she's got a really good point because the research that goes on out there suggests that people have no clue how much energy they're consuming. There's been a ton of research done in the US and Europe and some here in Australia where folks present some food Macaroni and cheese, for whatever reason, is the big one in the U.S., and they either have high energy density, like high-fat cheese, just macaroni, just the cheese, or they add in vegetables and they use low-fat cheese to have much lower energy density. And people who eat it don't feel like they've been ripped off. They don't feel like they've had less energy. They don't feel any less full. They don't eat more at the next meal. So all of these things seem to be suggesting that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. Effect is expected to be additive. Now, that's a bit of a statement, and my next slide suggests that maybe that's overstretching. But in the meta-analysis side of things, even here, sample size really matters. Because, yeah, the biggest sample size before was 38 studies, and we, we went up by a factor of seven. But seven? Hang on, no, five, sorry get my math right, from 38 to 183. So it does make a difference. We're, we're getting, even though it's still a small effect, we're getting a strong level of significance now. And it's really showing, yes, it does change things. The multi-level model can effectively deal with some of these dependencies, and that's one of the things that allows this small effect to actually show up as being significant, as you're taking out all this other rubbish, you're taking out this noise that is interfering with finding what the true result is. And just as important is the use of appropriate moderators, because that really does make a big difference to how we interpret the results, because we can take out the effect, or we can separate the effects for one group from another. Particularly in this case, where we don't have, like in medicine, you might say, we're going to um, test this particular drug on mice. Well, everybody uses exactly the same dose on exactly the same mice at the same age, the same size, all that sort of stuff, in which case it's a fixed effect. We would expect it to be identical across all of these experiments, all of these treatments. Here, 
We're not talking about that. We're talking about one person going into a sit-down fancy restaurant, another person going into a McDonald's, somebody else going into some sort of mid-level cafeteria kind of place, and we're lumping all this stuff together. So we have to understand that the effects are across a spectrum of possibilities. So it makes it a little bit muddier. So we have to pull these moderators out. One of the problems with this in meta-analysis is that most of the papers don't provide the information we're looking for, and you spend a lot of time on email going, hey, can you tell us a bit more about your sample? And in some cases, people are happy to do it. In other cases, you get a deafening silence. You know, no response whatsoever. But it makes it very difficult to code your moderators, because you're sitting there thinking, OK, well, here they say I've got all these, these people. Um, and they might tell you the range of BMIs. BMI range from 17 to 42, for example, is a, a common statement in these studies. But I'd like to know what that distribution looks like. Was there one person at 42 and everyone else was between 17 and 25? That's a completely different scenario from one person at 17 and everyone else is between 35 and 42. So it would be great to know what that is, but that's not provided. So we have to lump those kind of studies in with you know, just, OK, that's normal BMI. And interpretation of these moderators, particularly in light of one another or, or comparison to one another, is really quite challenging because they're not crossed in an experimental sense. These come from separate papers. So you're not controlling one thing while you're looking at another thing. So there's opportunity for biases to creep into this interpretation. So when I said in the previous slide, it looks like it might be additive, we don't know. These things could cancel each other out. It could be that you know, when you have overweight females, you don't get the sum of both of those things, but it's only just one of them, whichever was bigger. So we just don't know that, that answer, because no one has actually done that study. And we can't extract it. We're going beyond the data to say those sorts of things. So we have to use a fair bit of caution in discussing whether it's additive or if there are interactions, because we just can't tell. Questions? <laughs>